Have you ever been happy to be alive? Happy to just sniff the air, have fun with your friends, and pollinate some flowers? Have you ever been afraid to die? Why do people have to die? Have you ever wanted to die? Congratulations, you're a human being with functioning emotions. Life and death frame everything we do. It's part of every person that's ever existed and every person that ever will. Even the most benign forms of media and expression are at least mildly concerned with these concepts. When people die, they don't come back. They're extensions of us, of human emotion and struggle. There is a darkness within man, and I'm afraid you will peer into it. That doesn't mean, however, that we're all honest about it. We're often more content with avoiding the consequences of death altogether rather than deal with the reality of them. And in some cases, that works. However, some pieces of media get away with avoiding death when they really shouldn't. Call of Duty is all about struggling against massive odds and being the best action hero that ever was, but the stakes are always relatively low because the death of the character doesn't really mean anything. In these games, death doesn't signal anything other than failure. The worst thing that happens is that you travel back in time five minutes and have to listen to Sergeant Foley order you to get him some fries and a shake again. Secure the burger down. Burger down. If you get hit without any rings in Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic freezes in place, makes a face like he told him that most of his retirement fund was reinvested into Chuck E. Cheese prize tokens, and he falls off the screen and dies. But you can just start over no problem. In Battlefield Bad Company, you appear to be playing as the great nephew of Jesus Christ, because upon your gruesome and inevitable death, you're just resurrected 50 feet away from where you kick the dust. The world continues to exist as if your character hadn't died, but they absolutely have. Death happens in games like these, but it's not really death. Just some kind of cheap knockoff from the alternate dimension of no stakes. There's no reason why all these characters should be returning from the grave, yet they do anyway. In all sorts of games ranging from AAA first-person shooters to indie platformers, resurrection has gone from something reserved for religious icons to something that any Italian plumber can achieve just as long as he's got enough gold coins. Some games get around this problem by building a simple explanation for resurrection multiple lives into their worlds, therein making the respawning mechanic an organic part of a greater gaming experience rather than an anomaly that needs to be ignored or excused. In the Bioshock series, Vita Chambers, machines that heal all manner of physical trauma, are strewn about the city and heal the player upon death. Each time the player uses one of these chambers, the machine takes some of your hard-earned cash and spits you back into the world, good as new. It might not make scientific sense, but within the context of a city built under the ocean, it certainly makes enough sense to pass. Similarly, the new U stations in the Borderlands series are cloning machines that spit out a clone of the player character upon death. The technology isn't explained, but it doesn't need to be. The ridiculous nature of a cloned vending machine fits within the futuristic and often silly tone that permeates the Borderlands games in general. I wonder what it's like to have a belly button. These games prove that most of the time, you don't even need an elaborate explanation, just a simple display of action and consequence. In the recent Tomb Raider reboot, there are no Vita Chambers or new use stations, but there are horrible scenes of Lara Croft getting beaten to death, stabbed in the neck, nearly raped, and many other wholesome and family-friendly sequences. These instances might not explain why Lara comes back to life so many times, but at least it shows the player the consequences of the actions that led to Lara's death. Lara still inexplicably comes back to life because of video game, but at least the player's failure to ensure Lara's survival has some weight and consequence to it, unlike in Call of Duty when your character just falls over. Now, I'm not suggesting that all games should explore the concept of death in its entirety, and I don't even think that every game needs a complex system of death and respawning. Sonic's mysterious three lives aren't quite so heinous because Sonic isn't about building a world, telling a story, or even about adhering to the laws of nature. Sonic is about going fast, collecting rings, and beating bosses. It's all about game mechanics and play. So as long as its core gameplay mechanics and game logic make sense, its narrative and world building flaws are a little more forgivable. 
However, games like Call of Duty and their single player campaigns can't be excused in the same manner because their focus is on telling a story, no matter how basic that story might be. So, nice. When the success and failure and the life and death of a player character is integral to the story or the mechanics of gameplay, the consequences of death and failure must be felt to some extent. When a player character can be killed 57 times during one chapter of a game, but another main character can't survive one rogue bullet, the narrative has fundamental logical problems that inhibit its ability to function on a basic storytelling level. Yes, indeed. While games like Bioshock, Borderlands, and to some extent Tomb Raider address the issue of death only to the extent that in-game logical necessity dictates, the Dark Souls series of games, especially the original Dark Souls and Dark Souls 3, take what those games do one vital step further. In Dark Souls, the topic of death isn't avoided or skirted around. The game goes out of its way to tell you what happens to your character once your health bar runs out. You'll face death, and it won't be pretty. Upon any sort of character death, the screen flashes with giant uppercase red letters, You died, letting you know that, in no uncertain words, you weren't a bad enough dude to kill all the monsters after all. How is the You died screen different from a normal game over message? It's similar on the surface, but You Died is consistent with both the game's narrative and with the experience of the player. Not only has the player died and failed like in other video games, but the player character has also literally died within the game's narrative. Because death is a core narrative and gameplay mechanic, the You Died message doesn't break the consistency of Dark Souls' world. The game over message, however, while it does effectively inform the player that they failed, it completely breaks any sense of immersion or narrative fidelity. In other words, having giant text appear in the sky is stupid because Sonic doesn't know that he's trapped in a Barney the Dinosaur-esque version of the Matrix. Sonic has no idea that he's inside of a game universe. Within the logic of the Sonic narrative, Sonic just wants to save his squirrel friends from Dr. Pingus. Lives, continues, and game overs mean nothing within the context of the narrative. These elements are pure game mechanics that exist in conflict with the narrative elements of the game, and the game over screen is perhaps the worst one. The ring counter, life counter, and timer all just perpetually exist on the screen, and while they don't narratively make sense, at least they're consistent and serve a real purpose gameplay-wise. The game over screen, however, is an abrupt ejection from gameplay, a forced exit from being immersed in a game experience. Again, this is a little more excusable in a game that has a relatively unimportant narrative, but it's jarring all the same. The Dark Souls series asks, what if someone really could never die, and was always resurrected upon death? The developers of Dark Souls love death and hate life so much that they weren't happy just making people and characters die. They wanted to make planets and realms die too. In the first Dark Souls game, the world is dying and the player must rekindle the first flame to prevent the world of men and prevent the Age of Dark, a world state in which no fire, light, or any sort of disparity exists. In the Age of Ancients, the world was unformed, shrouded by fog. One of the symptoms of the fading of the fire is that people stop dying. However, this kind of immortality is a dismal curse, not a blessing. Instead of just dying, the mind of one of the accursed begins to wither away and hollow until he becomes a husk of his former self, a shell of a person who doesn't retain any real humanity. The player character is one of these undead and must preserve the flame to prevent the hollowing process from taking hold. But perhaps you can keep the torch lit. There is an old saying in my family. Thou who art undead art chosen. In thine exodus from the undead asylum, maketh pilgrimage to the land of ancient lords. 
The implication of the first scheme is that once the plate rekindles a fire, the hollowing process should disappear completely. However, Dark Souls 3 turns that simple story of salvation into something far more bleak. In Dark Souls 3, it's revealed that the rekindling of the first flame isn't just a one-time ordeal, it's a ritual that constantly needs to be repeated to keep the world intact. The fires will never stay lit and will always need rekindling. In preserving that disparity, the player also preserves all the horrible and dingy aspects that populate the world of Dark Souls, aspects that seem to far exceed their positive counterparts. Dark Souls is filled with horrible undead creatures, treacherous assholes, and environments inhospitable for anyone with hopes and dreams. Not to mention, the fire also demands sacrifice. The souls of the lords of the realm must be sacrificed in order to rekindle the fire. We see characters who, instead of fighting for the preservation of their world, see their existence as a struggle with no meaning. The fire linking curse, the legacy of lords. If this world of constant death and struggle has no permanent solution, and even death isn't an escape, why continue to let it live? Why not just let it die, and with it, all the negativity of the world as well? What Dark Souls sets up with narrative and theme, it answers with gameplay and interactivity. Players must carefully traverse the dingy castles and poisonous swamps that fill Lord Rings landscapes because there's always something around the corner that wants to kill you, and most enemies are pretty good at doing that. Your character is relatively fragile compared to characters in other fantasy role-playing games where you can simultaneously be the leader of the Fighter's Guild, Mage's Guild, Vampire Guild, and Lollipop Guild by the end of your journey. In Dark Souls, four rats can herd you into a corner and kill you in like three seconds. The world doesn't exist to support a player's power fantasy. The world fights the player back with everything it's got from start to finish. It forces the player to improvise and to use any means necessary to succeed, including cheesing enemies and sometimes exploiting glitches. The gameplay of Dark Souls is all about overcoming challenges and about the player unlocking his own potential for success. The game gives the player the tools to succeed, but it's up to the player to determine how to use them. If these basic concepts of success in the face of adversity and challenge are applied to the narrative themes of the game, then the very bleak and dismal world of Dark Souls starts to take a more positive turn. The environments may be filled with muted colors, everything might be trying to kill you, and you might fail more times than you succeed, but tucked away under that hardship is a glimmer of hope. The eyes show a world destitute of fire, a barren plain of endless darkness, a place born of betrayal. So I willed myself, Lord, to link the fire, to paint a new vision. What is thine intent? Success can only exist in the face of hardship, just like light can only exist in the face of darkness. Just because the fire needs to be tended doesn't necessarily mean that it's death, and that of the world is preferable. Dark Souls is all about overcoming huge challenges and defeating ridiculous odds. It doesn't really feel like success when a game hands you a victory, when a goal is so easy to achieve that a five-year-old with a DDR dance pad could do it. If success is guaranteed, or if failure has no impact, then victory is a hollow and empty achievement. Those intense and explosive moments that the Call of Duty franchise and other huge AAA titles are known for only mean something in context. A building exploding on a screen may be impressive once, but it's nothing more than sheer spectacle. There's nothing really keeping an audience or a player invested. Real attachment to a game or any other form of media comes from a real human connection. The best pieces of media and art aren't always the most expensive or impressive, but often the most intimate. The ones that stick with us the most are ones willing to explore concepts that we may not even want to deal with ourselves. It takes a strong man to deny what's in front of it. 
They may question our morals, our goals, our core belief systems, and even our reasons for being. That questioning might be hard or even painful at some times, but we only grow if we have our boundaries pushed a little. Pushing boundaries also means not taking anything for granted. Having characters revive themselves inexplicably shows a lack of interest in the building of a game or any other kind of narrative experience. Hanging a story about survival on an effectively immortal character's life is meaningless because there's no stakes. If there are no consequences to failure, then why would we care to succeed? Now, the point of all this is not to argue that all games need to explore death in its entirety, but they need to explore something. Sonic the Hedgehog may not make us question the meaning of life, but it does effectively capture the experience of being quick and agile. It's about navigating virtual obstacle courses, not about connecting with a character. If a game becomes solely reliant on spectacle and cliché mechanics, then there's no real reason to come back to it. The most successful games, and any other media for that matter, should thrive under scrutiny and exploration. If something begins to fall apart as soon as we shine a light on it, then it probably wasn't worth much of our attention anyway. We connect with media because it makes us feel. It reminds us what it means to be human. And if it doesn't make us feel, then what's the point?